So my name's Ann Taylor, and I'm Curator of Interpretation here at the Frist. And I want to thank you all for coming out tonight for our evening program. We had a lecture at noon today as well um, for the Dutch show, and so I was a little curious about who would come, you know, the noon versus the 6.30, and it's a completely different crowd, so it's really nice to have um, the opportunity to offer different types of programs here and attract different audiences. So the Frist Center for the Visual Arts Gordon Contemporary Artist Project Gallery features the interactive installations of Camille Otterbach in an exhibition entitled Tracing Time, Marking Movement. It opened today and it'll stay open until May 19th. Um, so have any of y'all gone back into the show yet? I saw some of you go in and come back out, um, so it's really cool. So we're excited about our lecture tonight. It's my pleasure to um, introduce Otterbach, who I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, so she, um, will discuss her creation and evolution of her interactive installation and computer-generated works. So before I start, just a quick thank you to a few of our sponsors. I want to thank the Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Tennessee Arts Commission, and National Endowment for the Arts, whose support allows us to offer these programs for free. I also want to thank our Frist Center members for their support of the mission and vision of the Frist Center. And if you're interested in becoming a member, you can find out information at our membership desk and also online. So tonight we have the great pleasure of having with us Camille Otterbach. Otterbach is an internationally acclaimed artist whose interactive installations and reactive sculptures engage participants in a dynamic process of kinesthetic discovery and play. Otterbach's work explores the aesthetic and experiential possibilities of linking computer systems to hum human movement in layered and often humorous ways. Her work has been exhibited at galleries, festivals, and museums internationally, including the New Museum of Contemporary Art, the American Museum of Moving Image in New York, the NTT Intercommunication Center in Tokyo, the Seoul Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Netherlands Institute of Media Art, the Taipei Museum of Contemporary Art, the Center for Contemporary Art in Kiev, Ukraine, and the Ars Electronica Center in Austria. Um, Utterbeck's work is also in private and public collections around the world. Some of her awards and honors include the MacArthur Founder Foundation Fellowship in 2009, the Transmediale International Media Art Festival Award in 2005, and a Rockefeller Foundation New Media Fellowship in 2002. Utterbeck also holds, two, holds a U.S. patent for a video tracking system she developed while working as a research fellow at New York University um, in 2004. Her work has also been featured in Art in America, Wired Magazine, The New York Times, Art News, and many other publications. It's also included in Thames and Hudson's World of Art, Digital Art. Utterbeck holds a BA in Art from Williams College and a master's degree in the interactive, in the interactive tele telecommunications program at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. She currently lives and works in San Francisco. So for those of you who haven't been into the galleries yet, we are open until 9 o'clock tonight. And as you all know, we're also free for college students every Thursday and Friday nights. So if you haven't gone into the show, I encourage you to go in there after Camille is done. Um, I think we'll have, all have a new appreciation for her work and enjoy having fun and experiencing that in there. And also, if you can't get enough and you want to hear more about her work from Camille in the galleries, you can come back tomorrow at 11 o'clock, where she'll actually be talking in the space about about what she's doing with her interactive works. So please join me in welcoming Camille Otterbach. Thanks for the introduction, Anne. Thanks to all of you for coming. And especially thanks to the Frist for having me um, and for Trinita and Mark, the curators, for inviting me here in the first place. This is really exciting for me um, to be showing here. This is the most comprehensive uh, exhibit of my work to date, so you all are lucky to be able to see so many pieces together. Um, as Anne's introduction witnessed, I've shown a lot of things, a lot of places, but usually it's one installation at a time, so the chance to really get to see um, the work, how the work has evolved is, is pretty exciting for me, too, just to see all the work together in one space, so thanks again to that. My family and I have been having a great time in Nashville, too, so it's fun to be here. So I'm gonna talk um, about a bunch of different pieces. Again, you guys are lucky that you actually get to experience the work. So I often just have to show a lot of documentation um, and especially because the work is really about your physical uh, kinesthetic experience in the pieces, um, that's sort of a bummer to just have to, to convey it by video usually. So um, hopefully you will take advantage of the opportunity to go into the galleries. Um, I started out um, in much more traditional media, painting, making objects. Um, I thought perhaps I was also going to be a biology major. So I've always been interested in systems and how um, different sets of rules and parameters interact to create an overall environment. So if 
you see the work, hopefully you'll, that uh, relationship will be clear. Um, text strain is the first piece I did using a camera as an interface to the computer, um, uh, which I did as my graduate work at NYU um, with another artist, Romy Ashitov, who was a student there at the same time. Um, this is the installation in Louisville, Kentucky at 21C, which maybe some of you have seen that there. It's, it's in the hotel lobby of, a, of an art hotel. Um, as you can see from the picture, people can use their bodies to catch these letters. I'll show a really quick video of it in, in a minute in case some of you have not seen it yet. Um, but this work came out of some thinking I was doing at the time along with some other people at NYU about um, our interfaces to our machines. And um, there's this wonderful exercise that Bill Buxton, who's a designer, used to do, which I'm not going to have you do in the interest of time, but he would say, take out a piece of paper and you have 10 seconds to draw a computer. And I mean, this was in the early 90s, so everyone drew that. Um, but he would point out that actually nobody who drew this had drawn the computer at all. What everybody drew were the interfaces to the computer. So the monitor is just showing us you know, what's in the computer memory, and the keyboard and mouse are just ways to get information into the computer. But the computer itself is you know, the, the chips and processing and memory that's going on inside there. Um, so, so we were thinking, um, how can you create a situation where this interesting set of rules can react to more than just one finger at a time as you're typing, or one single point and maybe a click from the mouse. Um, and even, even the screen really is not taking advantage of our depth perception or our binocular vision in the way that, that other kinds of art objects in the world might. And I think that lately that model um, has changed a little bit. Um, you may be drawing laptops or, or your iPhones or any kind of smartphones to create this drawing, which is lots of computers that are connected to each other in a certain way. Um, but I still think there's a lot of room for, for how that interface of, of how we physically interact with those machines um, could change. So TechStream was an initial attempt to think about that. I am going to show this quick video. TechStrain is a playful interactive installation that blurs the boundary between the familiar and the magical. Participants in the TechStrain installation use the familiar instrument of their bodies to lift and play with falling letters that do not really exist. Like rain or snow, the colored text can be caught, lifted, and then let fall again. If a participant accumulates enough letters along their outstretched arms, they can sometimes catch a word or even a phrase. So there's a lot longer video on my website that goes into more examples of people, inter inter people interacting. But again, you'll hopefully have your own experience with that. And my favorite moment in that documentation is in that little clip, which is the boy turning the umbrella upside down. Right? So the rules of the system are very simple, just that the letters have to move up to the top of any uh, dark object in the camera view. Uh, but he's posed a hypothesis, which is that if, if they're landing on the top of the umbrella, they may also land on the inside, and he can catch them that way as well. Um, so what really got me hooked on creating these interactive systems is that sense of discovery um, that people have in the system. So you're put in a situation where you don't really know what's going to happen or what the rules are, and the only way to find them out, because you can't read my computer code that I wrote, um, is to experiment and see what happens. Um, and I think that's a really valuable thing for us to do as human beings. Um, Mark in the catalog essay uh, reveals the poem that, that is falling in text range, so it isn't random. Um, I don't think everybody figures out that it's actually a poem, but most people figure out that the words are not totally um, chaotic, that there are actually words that are falling. So that's part of that process too, is, is what kind of meaning you bring to it or um, see in those words. So people have told me that this piece has told them all kinds of things over the years, um, none of which are in that original poem. But it really is about this, this construction of meaning. Um, so when Romy and I were first working on the piece, it was actually going to be part of a performance he was working on um, that was basically about memory um, failing, like what happens when you grow old or have Alzheimer's and can't remember things anymore. So the text that fell from the top of the screen would disintegrate. Um, but we found no one, that wasn't at all anyone's experience with this work as we were developing it, so it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, so the next piece I did um, was well, a few years later. So TechStream was 1999, actually. So it's, it's amazing to me in a way that it still feels so new. It's 14 years old at this point in time. Um, so I think it really was maybe um, things are catching up in terms of interfaces and, and our thinking about um, our machines right now. But so this piece uh, was a couple years later. Um, it's called Liquid Time. 
And as I was watching people um, with these camera interfaces that um, could allow a social space also, so I guess going back to that diagram of the multiple computers, one thing the camera lets happen is for multiple people to be in the space at the same time. And watching people have all these different kind of interactions and texturing, I started thinking, well, how could I make um, another rule-based system that let lots of people interact at the same time and but what was happening on the screen was that they were somehow getting different views of the same content. Um, so I was really interested in um, linear perspective, which is the main way that computer graphics are constructed in a computer, um, because that is a very known mathematical system. If we imagine there's a camera somewhere, we know how the optics work, and if we know where things are in a 3D world, we can calculate what they look like on a flat screen. So computers are really good at that. Um, you can even move the camera and stuff in time, which is how we get a, a lot of our interesting computer graphic animation that you're all familiar with. But so I was thinking, what's another system? Like we know from art history, there's lots of other ways to represent our experience. Um, so, so could I make this, this rule-based system that allowed lots of points of view at the same time um, based on where you're actually standing in the space? So I think from the, the you see the interest in language and text rain, um, what's, where is that really that boundary between our abstractions of words and our physical selves? Um, and I was thinking a lot about metaphors, like what's your position on this issue? Where do you stand on this, right? Which all imply you actually have a physical body as well as just a thought or an opinion about something. Um, so in this piece, as you move, um, you're fragmenting video. When I was working on the piece originally, it wasn't video that you were fragmenting, it was still images. Um, different representations of one place. So the closer you got to the screen, you kind of moved through this um, one of six different images. But I was keeping track of those images as a list in the computer, in my software and I, that I was writing, and I realized, oh, a list of images in the computer is the same structure as a video file in the computer, just a list of 24 images per second. Um, so what if instead of having you move through these different images, you actually moved through a video file? Um, so that resulting um, piece is the liquid time piece, which is here for you to experience. I'm not going to show you a video of that. I'm going to show um, a sort of updated version of that project, which I did as a public art piece for the San Jose airport um, in 2010. So the difference is it's a different uh, aspect ratio. Um, and also the clips that are in it, um, the clips in the original version of liquid time are about 10 seconds long, but all of one moment or one place, basically, in 10 different seconds. Um, the clips in this piece combine um, like five seconds of the present and five seconds of the really far past. So, so you'll see that in this video. Shifting Time San Jose is an interactive video installation that juxtaposes the past and present using the viewer's body as the interface to navigate between different times. In this piece, commissioned by the city of San Jose for a new terminal of the San Jose International Airport, viewers first encounter a projected still image. As they walk closer to the projection wall, the surface disrupts, revealing deeper moments of time in the pre-recorded video clips. Viewers are able to shift between past and present by moving towards and away from the projection wall. Shifting Time San Jose continues Utterback's Liquid Time series, which uses her custom software to deconstruct the video frame as the unit of playback. This strategy of fragmentation allows multiple moments to appear simultaneously and speaks to the possibilities of digital tools, as well as the fluidity of our personal memories. Unlike the previous liquid time pieces, shifting time San Jose extends the period of time depicted from seconds to decades. In this work, high definition video footage from the present blends with archival film footage from the 1920s through the 1960s. Each of the 20 scenes in shifting time San Jose pairs footage of a historic site or activity in the San Jose area with complementary contemporary footage. Some scenes depict recognizable locations in both the past and present.
Other scenes show people working at industries long gone, paired with employees in the current high-tech sector. Leisure and travel scenes from past eras are paired with their contemporary counterparts. Different forms of stasis and change are revealed as time shifts subtly within each clip, and more drastically between the different eras of historic time. As the past visually intersperses with the present, shifting time San Jose creates an intriguing visual metaphor of how both history and our memories of a place contribute to our experience of the present moment. So the explanation I like to give to people to kind of uh, visualize what's actually happening at the video fragments is if you imagine the video clip as a flip book, um, you know, like the kind you could flip through and see an animation happen, but stable at the top, and then imagine cutting that flip book into lots of vertical strips so that you could flip any um, of those vertical strips forwards and backwards independently of the other. And that's basically exactly what's happening in liquid time and, and in this shifting time piece. But what's causing those strips to move forwards and backwards is your body in the space. Um, so the closer you are to the screen, the further back any of those strips have flipped. And you're not a square or a flat thing. Um, so your nose is kind of flipping some things more than your shoulders or even your hands. So you get these really strange kind of fluid um, disruptions of time that happen. And so from a thinking about digital tools and media, like the voiceover was saying, it's interesting to me that once um, all this information of the 24 frames per second is in the computer, it does not need to be uh, accessed in the same way it was taken, right? So that single image um, happening 24 frames, I can take any piece of that out at any time that I want and show it. So it kind of, um, I think, still points to some stuff we maybe don't totally understand yet in terms of where this transition to having media be digital is taking us, but I think it, it's a hint. Um, this is an important piece for me um, in terms of my thinking. So both uh, Texturing and the Liquid Time series, um, the rules that I created in the software were we're, having, we're making something happen on screen that was totally immediate, right? So in liquid time, there might be a little delay as things kind of, those strips flip back to the front, but there's no kind of history in the piece itself. Um, and they're also both using imagery that we would expect to, be, to find with a camera, in a sense. I mean, in texturing, the letters are layered on top of that, but it's, you know, a live image of you. Um, and in liquid time, it was photographic uh, video imagery. Um, that was being disrupted. Um, but this piece was an experiment using the same software that is, is running liquid time, but I was using a, a camera, a zoom, instead of um, a fixed camera with things happening in front of it. So this imagery of the Brooklyn Bridge was fragmenting in very strange ways. The piece was called Crossing. So I was interested also in you sort of crossing this threshold of recognition about what is this that you're seeing. Um, but it got me thinking about maybe this projection surface could, could have a stronger relationship to the kind of painting and work I did um, before getting interested in, in digital media um, and that that surface could, could be more of a picture plane um, in the drawing or painting sense, not a photographic sense. Uh, so I started working on this uh, number of years series um, called External Measures. Um, which the initial pieces were actually quite boring because I hadn't, I hadn't got to this, to what I was just referring to, this point of thinking about the surface as having a history to it. So anything that was happening on the screen was happening based on where people were standing in the room, but as soon as they left, it wasn't there anymore. Um, so everything had the same kind of immediacy as, as uh, texturing or liquid time. Um, and this is one of the uh, sort of third piece in the series where I was kind of finally starting to get this idea of some, some sense of time being present in the screen. So things would happen and stay there for a little bit longer. This was called External Measures 2003. Um, and Mark talks really well in the catalog essay actually about the relationship between some of this work to obviously things like uh, Pollock and um, abstract expressionism where in those paintings, it's really the, the trace of your body that's left on the surface. Um, and there's something very similar happening here where, but the trace is being tracked by a camera, not by actual paint. Um, and two of these pieces, um, two of the, the last two actually in the series to date, um, are up here in the gallery. So Untitled 5 and Untitled 6. Um, and I'm gonna show a short clip of Untitled 5 for those of you who haven't seen it yet so you know what I'm talking about in the next slides. Oops. 
Untitled 5 is the fifth interactive installation in the External Measures series. In these dynamic works, the positions, velocity, and existence of various parts of a projected image depend on people's presence and movement. Some responses are direct and immediate. Other behaviors evolve over time based on the flow of people in the space. These painterly swaths are the results of intersections between current and previous motion in the space, conceptually linking disparate moments in time. Sorry, I cut that off a little short. Um, so with, with these pieces, it finally occurred to me that one person's movement in the space could like add material into this system. Um, so the graphic marks that get added by one person stay there and are still sort of alive. They still have um, behaviors that then react to the next person. So every time you walk into these pieces, you add stuff into the system that then can interact with the person who comes in after you or you if you come and go uh, multiple times through the pieces. Um, so that to me is something um, that I still think is a really uh, powerful idea, again, about how do we store things with digital media and then re-access them later, right? So your cell phone has all these slots. You can put people's numbers in that you then like click on their name and get their phone number. Um, what I'm doing here is the visual marks are sort of those same kind of containers, right? So anyone who's done any programming, a variable is like a place in the computer that you can put something and get it and take it back out and put it back in. So these graphic marks become like those slots in your cell phone that have some information about um, where they first got put down um, and perhaps something like how fast the person that I was tracking was moving when those, those marks got put down. So even that kind of information then I can recombine um, with what's happening presently to create interesting intersections. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit. This is the installation in a hotel lobby in Hong Kong, um, just so you can see it in another context. Um, so I'm going to run through some slides of while I was working on uh, Untitled 5 in my studio, because I think also with programming, people don't quite, it's hard to imagine, like, what is this process for an artist, and, and how does this thing come to be? So this is how it started. Um, my, my original question was, was just, can I um, create a system, again, after doing some of these other ones, that, that has a certain feeling to it, actually. Like, I wanted you to feel like you were pushing things away, and they were somehow contracting back, so this kind of web-like feeling. Um, so that was the result, let's see, of me, um, you know, there were these lines, and then as I walked through it, I sort of disrupted those lines. Not very interesting, right? Um, so I kept playing around, you know, now you can see, oops, I kind of was moving the lines a lot more. They kind of all would mush up in the middle of the screen. It started adding dots you could push around. Um, this was the first time, so I was learning, obviously, as all these things were happening, too. So this is the first time I figured out how to get textures to load in. Um, the piece I showed before, External Measures 2003, is all just lines, lots and lots of them. But here I figured out how to load textures, just that blue stuff. Um, and so then I replaced all the lines with Sharpie lines that I had drawn. So that was a little more interesting. So you could push, you could push these things around, um, just trying different things. Um, I realized I could use those to kind of build up a background as they moved around. So some would, some would erase by making white and others would draw by making green. So you'd get this kind of surface building up. You know, I just kept experimenting, different, adding things together. So this is probably a day or so of working, um, playing around with these kind of sprays of dots that could get pushed around. Um, and then I realized it was in, in this kind of situation, it was actually quite hard to see where you were. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I need a different kind of layer of information that helps people see um, that the system is kind of tracking their trajectory through the space. So these were my first attempts to sort of follow, you know, someone walking around in the space. Um, and that's the combination of that, the red line, with the white things being pushed around. And, you know, I just started, that looked kind of too graphic to me, so I was playing around with blending things. Um, and this is the real aha moment. So what was happening here is this was the, an original line through the space. But I realized, like, oh, what if I kept that information, like I was saying, in the computer, and then the next time someone walked across, they would disrupt that original line. So this gray is that first line being disrupted by the second person walking through. So that to me is the real aha, that you could create a connection between those two things. Um, and that eventually evolved into this idea of pushing things away and then letting them like move back to their original location. And here I was just testing out 
how to make that happen. Um, the red, the little lines were coming back to their original location in that. And I think some of these, these uh, are just interesting screenshots in a way of, of a working process. Different things playing around. So I'm going quicker now. Um, I came up with this other pattern of kind of little dots that would radiate out, um, which you'll see in Untitled 5 if, if you're in it. So that happens, um, I ended up using that behavior when someone stands still. So ultimately, so here's me just kind of messing around with all these different things, what can I create? And then comes the point of the same way you would in any other painting, composing those sets of things together. So I was kind of trying to figure out a palette of marks that react to the camera movement in certain ways. And then I started thinking about how do I layer them together into something that actually is interesting looking. Um, so here I had started using uh, different textures along, along each trajectory. So that was a, a trajectory, and then you can see the same little thing repeated over and over, which you'll see that in Untitled 5 if you go out and play with it. And here's where, oops. Ooh, the laser pointer's dying. These had been pushed off their original location, and then they're, they try to get back to their original location on that line, which is what makes these big smears. Um, so all those smears that you see in the piece are, again, this connection between the past and the present. And I started playing around with different, I, so I scanned in these marks that get put along your trajectory. So again, I'm always thinking about what are computers good at? They're really good at rules, they're really good at manipulating things. They're not so good at making like very visually rich marks to start out with. Um, like it would be very hard for me to use math to make as interesting of a trajectory as any of you would make just by walking into the piece. Um, so the camera data gives me this really rich kind of human erratic behavior. Um, the computer lets me make interesting rules to react to that. Um, and by the same token, this kind of starting mark, I couldn't figure out how to make that any more interesting than an ink blob that I had drawn and scanned in. Uh, but what the computer is doing is totally manipulating those marks all the time. So it flips them around, it changes their scale, it gives them a different color. Um, and that combination to me seems, seems to be very rich to combine those things. So this is getting close to the, the end of the, to the final piece that you see out there. They hadn't quite picked the colors yet. And these are more the colors of the final piece. Um, and people always ask, you know, you started as a painter, now you're a coder, what happens to this thing we call the artist hand, right? Like, I know Salvatore, uh, in his talk this afternoon, was talking about, you know, looking, analyzing really specific brush strokes of artists to determine if that is or isn't their work. You know, we, we feel there's something in that physicality that is identifiable. Um, but I think, um, I think there is a sort of way that that aesthetic um, that you carry in you does translate into computer code. So um, I hadn't drawn anything since I moved to New York. Um, so Untitled 5 was 2004, so I've been in New York maybe six years at that point. Um, and I had made Untitled 5, and then this drawing fell out of a notebook, which is something I had done in the 90s in Boston. It's actually very eerie to me how similar even the little dots um, and the color palette and everything are. So and this was one of, uh, again, a painting from before I moved to New York to go to grad school, sorry. Um, so I do, I think there is a way when you gain facility um, with any media that um, there, it, there is a personal, there's something very personal about your relationship with that media that does translate. Um, I had a great opportunity in 2007 to do something on a larger scale. So as an artist, you're always um, very grateful to the people that give you these chances. I've been applying for a long time to do some larger scale public projects because I thought my work would translate to that scale, but no one, you know, people don't want to don't want to be the first person to trust you often to do something because what if you screw up? Um, but Steve Dietz, uh, who was the curator of the Zero One Art and Technology Festival at that time, um, gave me this chance to do a large scale project on the San Jose City Hall. Um, so this piece is very similar uh, to the external measure series. The camera's up on the dome, though, looking at the whole plaza. So I was tracking way more people, um, and obviously at a larger scale. I'm not going to show um, that piece. It's in the gallery on the documentation DVD, if you'd like to see it. Um, what's important about that to the trajectory of my work was obviously being able to do something at that scale. And also, um, it was interesting how the projection worked on this very complex surface. So originally, I had wanted to scrim 
Um, there's sort of like a front metal part of this building that I thought it'd be much better, it'd be very easy to hang a scrim on that to project onto it. Um, that was not allowed because it would set precedent for hanging banners on the city hall. So I wasn't allowed to do that, so I just had to deal with projecting on this complex surface. Um, but it actually turned out to be a kind of beautiful um, scenario, which I'll, I am now using in my current commission, which you'll see last in this lecture. This is a piece called a roar organ, um, which again, once I had this chance to do one thing large, even though it was a temporary project, the project on the city hall, um, then I found it much easier to, um, to get other commissions to do large scale things. Um, so this is a project for a shopping mall, actually, um, outside of Minneapolis. And while it's visually very different from the um, pieces in the External Measures Untitled series, um, I think the idea is very similar. So the idea is that when people touch um, these certain areas on the hand railing, their touches are added to one of the hanging columns in little blips of light. Um, and so each column then would keep cycling the blips that you put in it um, until other ones got layered in on top of it. So it's kind of like a core sample of people touching the hand railing over time. So again, this idea of how is, how do we have a memory, a physical presence in an architectural space. Um, this documentation is also on the DVD in the gallery, so I'm not gonna show it now, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process. So um, when I got this commission, the original um, call was to do something on this big gray wall. They wanted an interactive piece, like everything I'd done before, to go over there. But what they also said they wanted was to create a social space in this kind of lobby. And to me, it didn't make sense that if you put something over on that far wall, which has like you know three feet in front of it over there, that that would be very social. Um, wherever I could think to put the interaction area where people would move, it just felt like it was kind of fragmenting the space. Um, so I thought the way to get people to interact in this area was to create something that happened on the hand railing so that people would be gathering around the stairwell and looking at each other. Um, and that's how I got the idea to hang something in that physical space, um, which also had the advantage of be having a physical presence in the daytime when there, there's these huge windows. And I did mention to them a projection probably wouldn't be very visible most of the day. And they said, oh, it's okay, it's Minneapolis. It gets dark here really early most of the year. <laughs> But I thought this was a better, better solution, that at least something is there. Even There are still times when you can't see the lights, um, but it, it has a nice uh, presence in the space. So this was the proposal. Um, it's like Julia Child, there's the piece. Um, it was actually a lot harder than that. Here's a detail of the hand railing. So the hand railing cycle different colors. If you touch it when it's pink, you're adding pink. If you, it's like Morse code. If you go tap, 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 little blips are added to a column. If you hold it, the column will fill. Um, so I got this commission and then I had to figure out how to do it, which was no, not, not so easy. So this is my first like, oh my God, I had told them I was gonna put lights in these columns. Um, how does that even work? Some butcher paper on my coat rack with some LEDs, just doing initial experiments about diffraction and how, how just starting to even get some ideas about how to do this. Um, I worked with a wonderful team, uh, my assistant Genevieve Hoffman, Brett Bowman did the engineering, he's here. He's my boyfriend also. Um, <laughs> Good teamwork, um, and I'll show you, the, you'll see the programmer Ian Smith Heisters in a minute too. So we first uh, experimented with different forms. It turned out that the column actually was, in the end, the best for this project. We decided that's Ian, um, who's the programmer. So I did not do the programming for this. Um, I was realizing with these bigger scale projects, like managing where the wires go and all the structural engineering and just the overall budget, um, that I had to a little bit step back from that role. Um, which is something I'm still kind of struggling with how to navigate that. Um, often the budgets are not big enough to really hire a project manager, um, but it's hard to do the creative aspect as well as all the things you need to um, manage in a project this scale. So Ian stepped in to, to work on the actual programming. This was prototyping, um, again, the columns. We built those ourselves, they're custom. These are some prototypes of the hand railing unit. You know, we had to figure out how to, what kind of glass made the most sense, whether it was sandblasted, how it was diffracted, or diffused, excuse me. Um, we're using something called a basic stamp here to read the capacitance sensors, which are the touch sensors. Um, for those of you that do Arduino programming, it's really the same thing, just a slightly different chip. Um, this is me and another volunteer, Stephanie, just soldering. So I like to show people this sometimes because we think when, a lot of people don't make technology things, so it's this kind of mysterious, like beautiful, seamless thing. It's still kind of really like a craft project underneath. 
Um, and once you learn those tools, it's not that much different than any other media. So that's us soldering together the railing sensors. This is on site testing. You know, we milled the sections of the railing with the slots for our sensors in them so that we were sure everything would work together. And we had a lot of cabling that had to run through there. So this was testing that on site. This is me and Brett um, testing the final sensors that, uh, and uh, displays that are going in that hand railing. And again, it really is like a craft project. <laughs> Lots of hooking things together. This is hanging the columns. This is me being very excited that they work. So again, lots of uh, nervousness about is all the cabling right in here and could we control the columns correctly on site and the um, hand railings in, in the railing itself. And I want you to look at, this is geeking out a little, sorry. I want you to look at that, which doesn't match over there, right? Now the reason that's there is we had to get all the cabling that controls and, re and sends the sensor data from here down into the floor back to our computer and they wouldn't let us mess with these at all for structural reasons. Um, so Brett figured out how to do this, which I think is really cool. So that clamshell hides all that stuff so that you don't even notice it. So again, it, technology often feels seamless. It's really not when you get under the hood of it. Um, so that's that project. Um, the, I finished a project last fall for the Sacramento airport. This is a similar um, scenario where the original space they wanted me to do the project in um, did not make sense to me at all as we talked to it, talked about it. It sort of didn't make sense to them either. Um, this is in the main ticketing term. <laughs> Sometimes things, you know, they had to commission someone for a certain space because that was what the, you know, their master plan said. But in the end, when we really talked about it, everyone recognized that didn't quite make sense. Because um, actually there's a 50-foot red rabbit that's hanging in there already by Lawrence Argent. So that was part of the reason um, that it didn't make sense for me to do a piece right under the rabbit. Um, and so I, I thought about this terminal space and what people were doing there and also thought that the kind of screen-based interaction um, or even these LED-based interactions where you were standing at a certain location did not quite make sense because nobody really wants to stand around in the ticketing terminal before security. Like people are very nervous. They really want to get through. They're not generally just hanging out there. So I thought that a piece that was much more ambient um, that reacted to the flow of people in that space rather than this kind of very um, engaged interaction made a lot more sense in this. So I guess I'm showing you these projects to kind of show how my thinking has evolved around sites and interaction in specific architectural um, and social spaces, right? So I think, you know, everyone, there's a lot of excitement about interactive pieces. Um, it, sometimes things get put places which don't make a lot of sense to me. Um, if you're really thinking about how people use the space. So there's a, a design issue in there as well. Um, so I proposed a piece that was a bunch of screens um, on this big glass elevator shaft that the animations on the screens react to the elevator and people pressing the buttons on the elevator. Um, so these are, again, I'm not gonna show you all. There was a ton of work that went into this too, but I'm just gonna show you the end product here or in installation um, of this river scene that. Um, will react to. This piece also reacts to the time of day. Um, so if it's sunset, it changes the sunset colors and nighttime and daytime and dawn are different. Um, I worked with two amazing animators on this project, uh, Michelle Higa uh, and Masaka, Masako uh, Miyazaki, um, who helped with these fish and um, the actual animation that's in the piece. Um, and there's two scenes. There's a river. Again, the fish follow the elevator. There's a couple different ones that do different things. And there's also a scene of a tree um, where the elevator movement blows the leaves around. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have good video of this. Hopefully, it will be on my website soon. Um, but the experience of working with these screens has kind of led to a new vein of work, um, which one of the pieces which you'll see um, in the show called Floating World. Um, so I just have two other things I want to show you. Um, that is one of them. So Floating World started. Um, with a question from um, an art, uh, a public art consultant for who does lobbies in New York City. And so she had this space where they had already um, decided they would have a long horizontal row of screens. So what you see that empty spot there, this was the first time I saw the site. They said, we're gonna put a whole bunch of monitors there. We need some art, um, you know, what do you propose? And this is a competition. There were other people, you know, submitting ideas. Um, so I just wanted to show you again, this kind of evolution of how do you, um, how do I, as an artist, kind of conceive of something and then what's the process to bring it into being? Because you can't see that from looking in the gallery. So I proposed um, that I would create something 
uh, related to a landscape, but a very abstract landscape um, that would constantly change. So a programmatic landscape, um, not a fixed animation. Oops, and that was the proposal. So um, I got this project and then had the task of trying to figure out how to do it. Um, I reused, so I, I forgot to say, when I worked on the project for the Sacramento Airport, um, the one with the many monitors, because I was working with these animators, um, I shifted from writing the code in C++ to um, using something a little higher level called Touch Designer, um, which is a piece of software um, that just has a lot more easy tools for loading images and controlling how they combine, though it still gives you all the logic of um, sort of programmatically, computationally being able to combine and change and scale and move things. Um, and it also helps with mapping that to all these different screens. So I was working with that. This is, um, I was lucky to get a residency at the Vermont Studio Center. So I had a month sort of, of focused time to work on this, which is really great. So this is me. Um, the title of this talk is Working Between Worlds, so I liked this picture because I'm messing with cables. I think I was actually packing up the screens at this point, but you can see on the table um, all the watercolors I was doing. So I made all the marks that then are in this piece and are manipulated all the time by the software. So this is not an interactive piece, I guess I'm transitioning to that type of work. Um, at least some work that is not interactive, but it's still a system. So in the same way that there's rules in text rain and rules in liquid time, um, rules about how the hand railings or this elevator control a system, um, there's rules about how all these different watercolor marks are manipulated. They're largely based on time. So things are moving in different temporal cycles and constantly recombine. So the piece that you'll see in the gallery is um, six of these 10 screens. So there's 10 screens in the actual lobby. Again, I'm just trying different things in my studio in Vermont. Um, and that's an actual screenshot of the, this touch designer code. It looks a lot like Max MSP for those of you who do that. This is sort of boring. It's just taking a long screen and subdividing it into what goes out to each of the monitors. Um, and I'm just gonna show a quick video of this so you can see it in the site. Oops, I think I, there we go. Floating World is a dynamically generated animation commissioned for the South Lobby of the Mercedes House Building in New York City. The 23-foot-long installation continues Utterback's exploration of the intersection between hand-drawn art and computer-generated images. Inspired by linear scroll paintings, and the site's proximity to the East River. Floating World combines painted watercolor strokes with specially designed computer software to create a flowing, watery landscape across 10 flat screen displays. The animation follows computational rules designed to produce a visual composition that constantly evolves. Long translucent marks slide past each other like waves. Abstract shapes reference birds or fish, and solid marks emerge from the bottom of the screen like rocks or mountains appearing to a passing ship. To create this piece, Utterback painted and digitized the watercolor strokes seen in the animation. She then wrote the software rules, which select, scale, and manipulate these marks in real time. When visitors encounter the piece, the diaphanous color, dynamic choreography, and varied yet dreamy pacing combine to create an ethereal and primordial world. With repeated viewings, residents can begin to recognize this world, anticipating its characteristics and rhythms. Because the piece never repeats, the world is never truly knowable. Its state is unique to each moment of encounter. So 
So I think that um, element of the voiceover is what ties this work um, to some of the earlier pieces. Because in the installations, you know, you can never have the exact same experience in them. It's not like a painting. Obviously, when you look at a painting, your state of mind and the context makes a huge difference. Um, but the piece is not actually changing um, in relation to time passing. Um, whereas all of these pieces are actually different at any time when you see them. In the interactive ones, it's because of people that have been in the space. And in this one, it's just because of time passing. Um, so that's something that's very interesting to me. I think I'm about out of time. Can I show one, a couple more things? Go over a tiny bit. Um, so I did a project um, this spring for the Foresight Foundation in San Francisco for the 75th anniversary of the Golden Gate Bridge. So there were 16 artists commissioned um, to do projects in Fort Point, which is actually the Civil War fort that's underneath the bridge. So the bridge engineers actually built the Golden Gate to go over the structure because it, they didn't want to tear it down, even though some people did, because they respected um, how cool the architecture was in that building. Um, so, I had this incredible opportunity to do a site-specific piece um, in this fort. And my spot was this West Cannon Bastion. Um, the bridge actually comes like right across like that. So this part's actually under the bridge. Um, and you can see it out this window there, which you'll see in a second. Um, so since this was very much about the site of the Golden Gate, which spans the San Francisco Bay, um, I wanted to to create a situation, and this is this idea of monitors which have big gaps, kind of like Sacramento. I was interested in, in how do you perceive a space that has these imaginary parts between the screens. So the idea is the coastline comes along here. This is the North Shore, um, Marin, Sausalito. This is San Francisco side, and there's the bridge um, in the space, the way I arranged the monitors. That's a rendering of what it's going to look like. Um, and I started doing research on um, the historical uh, pl placement of the shoreline. And my hypothesis was, because I knew the bay changes all the time and people have radically impacted the shoreline of the bay, that I could have a visualization where over historical time these shorelines were shifting. Um, it turns out that the reason the bridge is built there is because that's the most stable part of the bay. It's on solid rock. Um, so these shorelines really have not changed very much at all. Um, but what was interesting to me in doing the research is the way we've represented them has radically changed. Um, so the piece ended up really being much more about how we represent um, this, this edge of the ocean in various maps. Um, here's the installation. And here you can see, so I lined them up so that there's the bridge coming in the maps and there's it in the second, so that's the San Francisco side, Marin side. And then when you look at the window, which is behind us there, um, the bridge kind of lines up with the bridge out there. So I really wanted you to think about where you are actually standing um, at this moment. And there's a, there's a layer of plexiglass with an etching of the bridge on it. So, so at certain times in these historic maps, sorry, so in the end the piece has maps from, hand-drawn maps going back as far as like 1820, long before the bridge was there, up through our current um, satellite GPS imagery. So the, in the maps the bridges come and go, but it's always there on the etching um, on top of it. And so here's just some screen outs of what you might see on one of those screens. So that's the, fort, the actual fort where you're standing is depicted on a couple of the maps that you're seeing. So I basically animated a shoreline that is changing, that's acting as a, as a mat into one of the maps. Um, and there's sort of three levels of that. So you're always seeing at least three maps, um, sometimes more, because they're also fading in and out of each of those layers. So it creates this kind of collage of these different depictions of the same site over time. And every once in a while, I shot video of the, shore, the actual shoreline um, right around that site, and it kind of obscures the map every once in a while. Again, hopefully raising some questions about our, um, we create these maps as if things are permanent and they're very much not so. Um, there's one more. This one's upside down because of the way the monitor was. So this is the other side of the, the bay. Um, but to me, I didn't realize it until after doing this, I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, I sort of did another version of liquid time, actually, um, of this kind of history interpenetrating the present. Um, in some way, or creating a, a very dynamic collage of, of those different moments. So again, th but this is not interactive, other than you're standing in the site um, and sort of between these shores depicted on the monitors. 
and I think it speaks also of our technology of depicting this place. So one of some of the imagery is black and white aerial photography. Some of it's like very current satellite imagery versus these hand drawn or wood block wood prints. You can really tell the printing technology, something about the printing technology as well. So there's again another shot of the installation. They kind of each became little vitrines that you were looking down into. Okay, and the last piece. So, th so parts of that project too have influenced my current project I'm working on, which will be done this summer. So um, going all the way back to the San Jose project, I was thinking about how can you create a projection surface that has the richness that our eyes and our bodies are able to, to um, perceive. So everyone has screens now, they're everywhere, projections are everywhere. Um, and I was just getting tired of how flat they actually are. Um, so I started thinking about maybe I could um, create a more interesting projection surface that actually allows um, us to use our depth perception. Um, so this was the beginnings of a proposal of saying maybe I could combine, oops, my interactivity with some kind of interesting surface um, into a, an interactive space. Um, and so I'm working on a project um, for a client in Boston um, using this idea. So it's in a hallway, actually only three, so there's seven panels that will be glass with projection, only three of them actually in the end we decided to project onto and have be interactive. So um, three of the seven panels will be interactive. Um, I started working with Franz Meyer in Munich, who are like uh, a glass company in Germany that's been making stained glass windows since the 1860s, I believe, um, and is working a lot now with contemporary artists. So it was really fun to go um, experiment there, um, testing how projection actually does work on, on glass and what kind of surface do you need to reflect um, or absorb that imagery. Originally, I thought I would use some mirroring, which turns out to not work very well at all. Um, so these are just some of my tests of, of projecting um, and I worked out that in, I originally I thought I would use one surface of glass, um, but it turned out to be much more interesting if you had a couple different surfaces with different opacity, different areas of opacity and different areas of transparency. So you could see it's a little hard. This is part of it's, it's very hard to photograph this, right? Because again, we're back to a flat image, um, but the light is is forward on this gray area, um, and then all the way hitting the wall in the totally transparent area. So there's there's two different layers the light can land on and bounce back, and we, we see that when we're looking at it in real life. And, and I was also experimenting with sandblasting. And so you'll see this. Um, um, at the same time, I was, I was thinking maybe I could do some smaller scale works using these principles, which is the last two pieces um, that you'll see in the gallery, the fluid studies pieces. So those are some smaller experiments um, that I worked on the glass while I was here in Germany. Um, but those have monitors behind the glass surfaces instead of projections on them. So hopefully you'll see as you move around in the gallery space, your perception of those pieces really changes. Um, and so after doing that experimentation, I, I went back to the design for the client um, and thought about what that would be. Um, and again, showing this working between two worlds idea. I, I write software, um, I work with computers, but there's still a lot of physical um, work that happens in creating these pieces. So this was thinking about what the design of this glass was going to be in my studio um, and working on some prototypes on acetate um, to hang on the client site to kind of see if the design was working or not. So it's, you can see the double layers of everything. So we're thinking about how is the projection going to hit the front layer or the back layer or the wall. And I'll be working with Michelle Higa again, who's the artist, um, the animator I work with the Sacramento project on. And this was um, our site test. So we, we shipped all that acetate to Boston and hung it up and kind of I've revised some of the design based on that. I never imagined I would spend so much time in a hard hat as an artist. <laughs> but I have. So that's the site. And um, I went back to Germany then once the client approved the designs and uh, worked with Franz Meyer on all the specific techniques of how exactly each part of that design would be painted and what the sandblasting would, would look like. Um, and that's Marcella who's actually going to do the painting. So this painting on glass is actually quite complex. It's not, they, I asked them like, don't some artists actually paint their own thing? And, and Klaus said, oh, they try, but they give up. Um, 
because the way that pigment moves on the glass is just so different than how paint on canvas or even watercolor moves. So it's, it's an interesting thing for me to have to trust them to paint this design that I've worked with. But we worked so closely together um, for a week on every little element that I, I feel pretty confident. And she's doing that right now, actually. Um, so those will be shipped to Boston and I'll, I'm working on the animation on the, inter so, so those three screens are interactive in a similar way um, to Untitled 5. Um, that I'm, so I'm working on that animation now. And this is one of the prototypes for one of the pieces that's in the gallery. So nodules is one of the fluid studies. Um, so this was me doing sketches and picking colors for um, the glass that's in front of the monitor here. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy those pieces and I look forward to your questions. Um, that was a totally crazy project. We, got, we were under contract in probably February, and it was up by September. Um, I'm not sure how we did it, honestly. It was crazy. Um, but I was so excited to have this opportunity that I just, you know, I think sometimes artists, um, where there's a will, there's a way, and it's just, I mean, but I relied on so many people. I had so many people volunteering just to help me because there was no way we were going to finish it in time. So tons of people volunteered their time to help us solder, to help us on site. Um, so I really had a, a lot of help in addition to Brett and Ian and, and Jenny, Jenny who was helping me a lot. Um, one of the problems with the way public art commissions work, that was a pseudo public private commission, um, is that a lot of public art commissions are designed on an older model. Um, so you bid up front for the whole project, or they have a budget for the whole project, and you commit to what you're going to do, and then you get hired, and then you have to do what you said you were going to do. And with a lot of these technological pieces, there's not like a prototyping phase. I mean, there's some phases built in to like do a design, and it has to get approved, but there isn't a phase that lets you really vet what's it really going to cost. Um, so I pretty much ate my shirt on that project. Um, even with all the volunteers, I didn't pay myself which is stupid, you know, but as an artist, again, that, that project to me was such an important one towards doing these other ones that in the end it kind of worked out. Um, but it's, it, it's a problem. Um, the, fixed, the fixed fee thing also, the artist takes on all the risk. You know, if something goes wrong, it, that's your profit that you eat. So it's, it's something I've been thinking about a lot and I'm not quite sure how to address it. Um, you know, everyone else on the projects has their hourly rate and they get paid it no matter what happens, you know, the electricians, if something goes wrong, they don't come back for free to fix it, but that's kind of the state of public art in our culture right now, so it's changing. Um, it, the, the exciting thing is that they're willing to do media art now, which was not the case. Um, a lot of the public art commissions, you have to guarantee your work for 30 years, um, which is not the case for these projects because they know that's crazy. Um, so there, some of the cities are working out ways, how, you know, we want this kind of work. We know we can't require the artist to guarantee it for 30 years. So how do we have a plan for maintenance or, or some budget? So like Sacramento actually has an endowment um, for maintenance, which is the reason they could do media works at all, is they know they're going to have to replace those screens at some point, you know. And actually, that's, I didn't talk about that, but with even the private commissions, um, the one on the glass panels, part of the idea of that project is that if you know, in a certain number of years, they don't want to upgrade or maintain the projection and interactive part, they still have a beautiful piece of glass on their wall. So the idea of how can some element of this commission kind of degrade gracefully um, is something I've been thinking about a lot. Because I still want to do the work, you know, now and, and have it up and running, and it's, I don't think it's really realistic to guarantee it's going to run forever. So. a really good question. Um, I think we're clearly all of the above, right? Like, I mean, so many biological systems have many, many layers within them. Like, I don't remember tons, tons of that um, learning. But like, you know, your, your arm muscles have short twitch muscles and, and long twitch muscles. And some are good at stabilizing and some are good at pulling, you know, and both those things work together to allow you to hold out your arm. 
So that idea of, of multiple layers is something I've been trying to put into the work. So that's layer and a system, and it's definitely part of us. Um, and I think, again, biology is really, there's often lot, lots of redundant systems to accommodate noise and error um, in genetics, and again, how we move, how our brains work. Um, so that, thinking about those models and, and how is that interesting as an artist is something that I definitely do. That's a, that's a longer question. I think that's, we need some we need some philosophers maybe to help us with that one. Too. Anyone else? Can you share the name of your tool that you use again to split the images across? Multiple? Yeah, so it's something called Touch Designer. Um, it's a company in Canada, and so for a long time, the software you would need to map uh, a big image across a lot of screens like that it was super proprietary, wildly <laughs> expensive. Um, and it's just com processing has gotten so cheap that they've worked out a, a fairly, you know, they, they're actually, you can um, download their software for free at a certain resolution. So I have to buy a license because I'm doing enough pixels, but it's a great uh, tool to, to experiment with. And then a follow up on, you were commenting on maintenance. What kind of decisions have you made to reduce that for you? Like, are you running these things on PCs or Linux or what are, what are these displays running on? Um, some of them are still Windows, which is a bit of a problem. Um, some are Linux, which is better because it's an open standard for those of you that don't know that. So, you know, if Microsoft changes something and, and they change, you know, I can't buy Windows XP machines. So a bunch of the machines running in the gallery are Windows XP. Um, I haven't upgraded all the software to run on Windows 7. It won't run. Like if I just run the Untitled 5 and Untitled 6 that are running here, they won't run on a Windows 7 or Windows 8 machine. Um, and Microsoft doesn't publish like what they've changed necessarily from a code point of view. Um, so over time, you're a little more vulnerable to that, which is why people like things like Linux, which is all of that is published and open, so you can see what, what's happened. Um, the main thing I've done is, is things are networked now, so like we can check in on the Aurora Oregon piece and see what's happening. We actually did have to just do a repair to that, but it ran for three and a half years. One of the um, components that controls the LEDs just burnt out, so we, we had to replace that. We tried really hard on that piece, I mean, largely due to Brett, um, that those railing sensors are a totally self-contained unit, like you saw in one of the pictures they plug in, so we knew that those might fail at some point, and we didn't want to fly out there and be pulling apart the hand railing with people on site, so those come out, and we actually made a wooden piece that goes into the hole, because you also can't have a hole in your hand railing, right, in a public space like that. So. We did anticipate like what would happen if one of those needed a repair. So I try, you know, and in the um, Sacramento piece, the way the software is built, you could replace a screen and change its size, and that would be very easy to accommodate in the software. So trying to think a little bit about how do you make things flexible so that when things change, you're not totally stuck. But I've learned that over time, I think, just by realizing when things are not so easy to fix. Um, So I would always prefer to be involved earlier rather than later. I mean, because of some of these issues that came up. You know, it's like you get called in later and it's like, why do you want the piece there? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I have some experience with that. So with all due respect to the people making those decisions, sometimes they have a really great idea and a great site, but often it just doesn't make a lot of sense based on my experience. Um, so if we could have a conversation about that and I could offer some ideas and ultimately they can make the decision, but that um, collaborative aspect of that helps, I think, to have the work make the most sense in a site. Um, and even just for stuff like all the electric um, cabling that has to go in and where the cable runs are, the sooner, you know, all my stuff for the last commission I was showing, that was new renovation, it's all pulled, it's all there, like all the Cat 6 I need, all the power is where I need it, so you're not like trying to put it in retroactively. And often even a new construction that happens, because they don't try to hire me till later on and we have to go back in and add power outlets and all this stuff, which costs more, so. Um, and wait, what was the last part? Is 
I think it's usually a client that wants to work with me, right? So the challenge of like, what's this new space? Like, what can I do there? Um, I mean, one of the problems with that, though, is I'm always doing new things. I mean, it's what keeps me interested. It's not the wisest from a sort of financial point of view to keep always experimenting, right? Like, you're, you're at risk all the time because things could fail or you don't know how much it's going to cost, things like that. But, um, you know, for whatever reason, that's what makes me happy, so. Uh, for now, I probably wouldn't do a project that had a kind of content constraints in the sense that like it needs to have a butterfly or, you know, I mean, I actually did just get contacted by a cruise ship that it had to have butterflies. So I just, you know, I thought about it, but I didn't, if I had had a good butterfly idea, then that would be fine. But I didn't, none, nothing came to mind that, and they really were not being, I, I did, we had a really bad relationship around discussing where this would be cited because there were a lot of possibilities and I just, I didn't feel they would be good to work with in that sense. So I think it's largely feeling a trust that they respect what you're good at and, and that, you know, I respect what they care about on the site and how do we work together to do something. So those are the ideal situations. Yeah, all the, all the processing for these multi-screen pieces and just the layers of imagery, like the floating world piece, it's still a little slow if you look at it in the gallery. I'm running it on a different machine and in the documentation it's a little slow even on the site. Like I'm really pushing what that computer can handle in terms of frame rate. Um, there's no way, like texturing, that the machine, you know, when texturing was first shown it was 320 by 240 video and that was really just about as much data as any machine could handle at that time, like running a video at 322.40. Um, this is before you could download video on the internet even, right? Like blink tags kind of era. Um, so th yeah, so things are just faster and you can do so much more processing. Um, that's actually what the patent is for in texturing because what we, Romy and I were doing is so dumb compared to what other people were trying to do computer vision systems that actually built up a model of what was happening. Um, and so we just kind of took the exact opposite approach, largely because we didn't know any better and it was the only way we could figure out to make it work was you, all, all I need to know in texturing is what color is the pixel each letter is trying to go to. So it's totally stupid. It has no knowledge of where is a person, what is a person, and we just set up the environment, which you'll see in the gallery, there's some lighting on the wall, so the wall behind people is white lit so you're darker when you're in front of it. So I've controlled the situation um, and, and used a very, very simple rule in that situation to make it work. And the illusion is that these let, you can push these letters up because that's visually what's happening. Um, but a lot of other systems are far more complex. So the, it was the novelty of looking at things from a sort of stupid point of view, which was unique about that. Um, sorry, we're getting really techy here. Seems like that's the interest. Um, that's a great question. So there's a design, again, this design is coming in to the interaction a lot on that level. So there's, the, what, what are the rules that make this interesting imagery on the screen? Um, and where's the complexity in that? But there's a lot of, you know, pure design that goes into that. So some of the things I was saying about, as I was developing Untitled 5, I realized from my experience, having watching people, having watched people in these other installations, that if you don't give them something very clear to start testing, they're just gonna feel like there's this random thing. And a lot of interaction, uh, interactive pieces are like that, unfortunately. I guess it's just you know, learning and watching and seeing what's working and not working. 
Um, so there's a lot of pieces where you have no indication to be able to find yourself. So if you look in those pieces, there's like a gray, crackly stuff that's around your outline, which lets you test. Like, oh, I'm putting out my arm. Oh, that's me. Like, I can see, I can test it. That's my foot. It can see me. Oh, I get it. Like, the camera's on the ceiling, or the ca you know, you have some visual feedback about where you are. Um, and by the same token, it actually erases in the center of where you are, which lets you see that. So in some of that process of working it out, you couldn't see that, and you, couldn't, you still couldn't tell, even though you had this nice outline, you just visually couldn't see it. So it's making that clear for people. Um, and the lighting on the floor is also part of that. Um, so that came you know, by trial and error. So the first time I showed Liquid Time, I was it a gr you know, tons of people at the opening, and it was just, the space was packed with people, and the piece was just going crazy, and everyone thought I just made a really crazy video. Right, so there's no way to understand that it was reacting to you or where it was looking at you or what was going on. So over time, um, you know, and I have tried different solutions like taping the floor in different ways or painting the floor. And to me, the light, um, when you have a high enough ceiling to make those really clear rectangles of light is a very in keeping with the projection way to indicate that's where the piece is. Part of the floor is part of the piece. It's not just the projection, like if you're in this area in the floor. So I think it's, and those are all, again, design kind of issues of thinking about um, how do pe people, so if the light's on the floor, even in a crowded opening, people, um, again, we've evolved for so many years to have these cues. They can be drinking their wine looking this way, and it's almost like they don't back into it, because you sense that there's something there. Lighting design is like that. It's very, very subtle how it influences us to walk places or not. Um, so again, I like paying, that's part of what I like in being an artist is paying attention to all that stuff, but I think um, you do need to, some of it's trial and error, but thinking about those things in terms of interaction design is important. I think that's it. <laughs>